Hello everybody, my name is Aaron Standard, and today we're going to talk about a little side project that I just got finished uh, earlier this morning, which is Incrementalist 1.0. Now, Incrementalist is a incremental build tool for large .NET solutions and monorepos. And we've been using it in the Aka.NET project for quite a long time now. But Incrementalist 1.0 is a really big change from the versions of it that we've been using. Yeah, in fact, if I go to the NuGet page here, this is for the Incrementalist library. The package that you really want in order to use this is the incrementalist.command. This is the .NET tool that will actually go ahead and perform these incremental .NET builds for you. And I'm about to show you all how this thing works. But I just wanted to kind of illustrate real quick, we've been using this in production since like May of 2019, so roughly six years. And Incrementalist helps cut Akadonit's average build time down from like an hour and 15 minutes. That's what a full build takes. And that's with us running several jobs in parallel. The longest single job we have, which is our multi-node test suite. That's how we test Akadot cluster and other tools like that that are distributed. That tool takes an hour and 15 minutes to run its entire test suite. We are able to cut the average build time down on our pipelines to about 15 minutes using Incrementalist. And let me kind of illustrate that for you real quickly. Now, if we take a look here at the analytics for our pull request validation for Azure DevOps, it says that our, I guess, 80th percentile pipeline duration is about 18 minutes and 29 seconds. This value will fluctuate kind of depending on what we're doing at any given time. Lately, we've been doing a lot of work on core Aka.NET, and those builds always take the longest. They require a full rebuild of everything. But if we take a look at our pipeline duration reports here, and this is going to be a little thrown off because I just changed everything. But if we go back to our, let's take a look at some of our runs here. We can see that we've got some runs. This one took under 10 minutes. This one took about 11 minutes. This one took about an hour to go ahead and run. This is a full build. It's because we manipulated the Aka.NET test kit here. We're basically working on changing that. That means that everything in the entire test suite has got to get executed. So that's an example here of sort of what the average build times look like. Whereas if we scroll down to, let's find a pull request where we're working on something a little bit smaller. Here we go. This one isn't quite passing yet, but this pull request deals just with Aka Streams. Aka Streams is the biggest single test suite that we have, but none of the other libraries like Aka.Cluster Cluster Sharding or Aka dot Persistence or Aka Cluster take a direct dependency on Aka Streams. Therefore, this build only took 24 minutes, even though it didn't succeed yet. There's probably some problem we still need to fix here. But that's an example of what we're trying to achieve with Incrementalist is help make sure that your cycle time goes down as a software developer and you get feedback more quickly from your build system. So Aka.NET's a fairly large solution. It has approximately 100 projects in it. So being able to go ahead and get faster feedback from our big test suites and everything else really helps uh, reduce the amount of time we have to spend waiting on the CICD system. So let's dive in a little bit and talk a bit about Incrementalist and why we built it and how you can use it in your own projects. So this is the Incrementalist repository. It's in the Petbridge GitHub organization under Incrementalist. And if you scroll down here, we actually have a fairly good set of documentation for how to use it and what are all the various you know, command line and configuration options are. We won't go through all of them today, but we'll cover some of the ones you might want to use for, for real work. The gist of this library is that it leverages libgit 2 sharp and Roslyn to compute an incremental diff for a large solution. And in fact, the blog post I wrote that goes along with this video gives a pretty good illustration of that. So we have a, a piece of documentation that goes into full detail for all the different little workflows. And if you really want to like contribute to Incrementalist, it'd be good to read that. But as an end user, this is all you really need to care about. You make some changes, and even if you don't commit them, Incrementalist can detect it. And you, when we run Incrementalist, it'll go ahead and perform its analysis, and it'll either recommend doing a solution-wide build if the change set is big enough, or it'll recommend building only a small set of projects. Now, what the older versions of Incrementalist did, the ones who've been running in Akadana all these years, they would just give you those recommendations as like a text file or a string. What the new Incrementalist 1.0 does is it actually executes all the .NET commands for you. Therefore, you can just run the command line tool and it'll just do the thing now, rather than forcing you to figure out how to parse these files and forcing you to make decisions about what to do with this information. So if we scroll down here, imagine the following scenario. 
we have a dev branch. This might be our trunk. So you might have this called master or main inside your repository. Dev is just what we've used in all the Aka.net projects for the past decade or so. And then you have whatever your feature branch is, feature slash name or whatever the case may be. It's not really that important. What incrementalist is going to do first is it's going to compare what is on your feature branch with what's on the base branch. That would be dev in this case. So if we have the following solution structure where we have our root, uh, we have our solution and a global.json in there. Then we have our source and our test folder and we have a couple of projects in here. We might also have some shared dependencies like directory.build.props or directory.packages.props in here. And then we have our test folder, which might have unit tests that reference each of these projects. And imagine for a moment that project B depends on project A in this case. So in the event that you modify project B.tests, let's say you go ahead and you add a unit test that wasn't there before. Incrementalist would determine that only B.tests needs to be run. So instead of running everything inside your test suite, it would only run that one test project, which would help reduce your total execution time. Well, imagine that we go and change b.csproj directly. So rather than just editing the test project, we actually edit the core project. We would then determine that all of the .NET commands need to be run against b and b.tests. And then if we modify, let's say, project A, we would determine that the entire solution needs to run because every other project either has a direct dependency on A, so B depends on A, A.test depends on A, and then transitive dependencies too. B.test depends on B, and B depends on A. Therefore, B.test has a transitive dependency on A as well. We would just recommend a full solution build at this point. It's actually going to be simpler than trying to run you know, every single one of these .NET commands individually. And then finally, Incrementalist also has support for detecting if a solution-wide file has been impacted or not. So that could be nuget.config or global.json or any of these directory.build or directory.packages.props files. And then here's the thing that's really cool. If you import another props or target file into one of these, we can detect that that will trigger a solution-wide change as well. So incrementalist is pretty sophisticated at being able to determine all of this. So let's go ahead and take a look at some real examples of working with it in just a second. Now, before we get into actually running incrementalist, first thing I should probably explain is how to install it. Look, the actual instructions on nuget.org will explain all this to you. It'll kind of show you how to do it here. But if you want to take a look at our blog post, we actually walk through it as well. First thing you'll want to do if you want to install it globally is do .NET tool install dash dash global incrementalist.command and then pass in the version number here. Most recent version as of this video is 1.0, but that will probably change in the future. I personally prefer doing local tool installations instead because I find them to be more uh, version control friendly. And also they work with Dependabot. So Dependabot can come in and automatically update the version of the tool that you're using. So the first thing you'll do is create a local tool manifest. This will create a dot config slash dot net tools dot json file at the root of your repository that's what this is right here and then you can also go ahead and call dot net tool install that will populate this file with this json specifically for incrementalist now as a little fyi i strongly recommend you set roll forward equals true this will allow incrementalist to work with newer versions of the dot net runtime that weren't available uh, with the version that was compiled so we compiled incrementalist with i think dot net 8 so if a .NET 10 preview or whatever comes out and you want to use incrementalist on a project with that, if you set roll forward to true, this will allow incrementalist to work. So no problem at all there. Now let's go ahead and take a look at actually using incrementalist on the command line and see what sorts of things can we do with it. Okay, so I've got the Aka.NET command line right here, and I'm going to go ahead and do .NET incrementalist, and I'll do help. Oh, I got to do a .NET tool restore first because I just upgraded to version 1.0. So let me do that real quick. Okay, now we'll try running help. And you'll get a set of verbs that are available. So we get the run verb, uh, list affected folders. This will just kind of give you a dump of all the folders that have files in it that are affected. And then we have create config, which, as you might have guessed, helps you create a configuration file that you can use to automatically configure incrementalist without having to specify everything on the command line. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a run command, and I'm going to pass in the dry parameter. Dry allows you to do a preview of what you're going to do on the command line without actually running it first. So essentially what you'll see incrementalist do is compute the build graph, and it should emit, once it's done, here's the set of things that need to be executed afterwards. 
Next, I'm going to pass in a branch name. I'm going to say we're going to take a look at the development branch. And then I might mention down here, uh, we'll do verbose logging. So I think it's dash dash verbose. And then we're going to in actually add our .NET command on here. I'll go ahead and do build uh, C release. And maybe I'll pass it in. Yeah, that should be enough, actually. We'll go and do build C release. All right. So let's see what happens. I'm going to pause here for a second because we have to analyze the whole solution, which sometimes could take a little while. Oh, there we go. Actually, well, we're getting all the verbose feedback, which is nice. And this will carry on for a little bit. Roslyn has to fully analyze the whole solution, which means loading all the projects into memory, loading all the files that belong to those projects, and et cetera. So we don't really benefit from IDE caching the same way that Writer or Visual Studio might. So this is one of the performance issues that we would love to solve with incrementalist at some point in the future. But for the time being, it'll probably take it about 40 seconds or so to fully load the Akadonit solution. Well, and by the time I finished talking, it had done that. So no need for me to cut at all. So on this particular job, we found nine affected files. And there was eight source files that were modified and one project file. And so then we're going to go ahead and analyze the solution-wide impact. And it looks like we evaluated there were 69 projects that were impacted by this particular change. Huh. Well, that's pretty interesting. If I go ahead and do, oh, let's change this to, I don't know, instead of build verbose, why don't I go ahead and change this to list affected folders? Let's do that real quick and see what it comes up with. It detected 13 affected folders and it wrote them to bin output incrementalist.txt. I'll show you in just a second how we determine that. Actually, you can kind of see a hint here. It's because we loaded this default configuration file. But if I take this and I do, you can't really see it on the command line currently because of where my head is at. So let me go ahead and move this over here. Yeah, you can see here, detected 13 affected folders, uh, bin slash output incrementalist.txt. Let me go ahead and clear the screen. And then we will go ahead and dump what's in here. And you can see all the different folders where there were changes, which ironically enough, includes the .config folder in this case. All right, well, that's all well and good. Let's go ahead and take a look at the configuration files that I'm using here. Let's see, it's dot slash dot incrementalist. I've got a number of different little configuration files for Aka.net. Let's take a look at, oh, let me go ahead and do cat and we'll do incrementalist.json. This is my default configuration file and a couple things that I have specified in here. First is that we're always going to log the graph that incrementalist used to the bin slash output slash incrementalist.txt file. I usually export this as a build artifact in Azure DevOps so I can go and review it later just in case there was something screwy that should have happened. So for instance, if I expected these projects to run and they didn't, this will help me debug that and I can go you know, file a bug on the incrementalist repository if there's a problem. But the really big time saver is I specify my default Git branch we're going to compare to here. That's the development branch. And then finally, I could specify a couple of other options, like do I want to parallelize command execution? How long do I want to give each command to run? And then down here, we have some globbing commands. This is really useful in case there's certain projects you want to be able to skip in your production build environment. So if I go back to here, and I can see that we've got this tests only.json. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Now I can see that we've got a little bit more interesting configuration file. I'm skipping any projects that are in the examples folder and any projects that you have this dot multi node suffix. This is because we have a separate build task that executes multi node tests. In fact, you can see the configuration file for that right here. These are all the projects that I'm interested in running when we're using this configuration. Only our test projects, plus this one kind of oddly named one down here. So when that happens, you know, we're, we're going to end up always filtering down the set of all possible projects down to a much smaller number. And in fact, if I go and tab through my command line here, I should have, yeah, here we go. This is a dry run of our real test configuration that we use. And this is our real command line that we use in Azure DevOps for trying to run our tests on .NET 8 uh, for basically you know, CI CD purposes. So if I can do the dry run calculation right here, we're going to get back a very different looking result than what we did using the default configuration file. So this time around, I will go ahead and cut for a second.
Okay, now I'm going to resume here. Now I know that I might have blocked the command line itself uh, with my uh, face on the video here. But here's the command that I ran. Uh, this is just .NET incrementalist run. I'm passing in the dry parameter here. I'm specifying my configuration file. And then we're running a test, but we're also specifying that we don't want to build the projects. That's because that happens in an earlier build step. We only want to run our .NET 8 tests here. This is because we also have .NET framework tests that we run as well. We don't really want to run those at the same time. We separate them into two different build stages. We want to use the TRX logger. This is what Azure DevOps needs in order to get everything neatly formatted for its test reporting. And then finally, we specify the output directory where .NET tests should dump everything. So everything that happens after this dash dash, this is the structure of your .NET command. And then down here, we can see that we originally tabulated 69 projects for the build, but after we used that globbing we just took a look at inside that configuration file, we only ended up with 24 projects at the end. So that's super useful there. So that'll do it for our little deep dive into incrementalist. I'm gonna include a link in the description. I would strongly recommend that if you have a large repository or a mono repo or really anything with let's say more than 20 projects in it, give incrementalist a try and give us some feedback. Open a GitHub issue. If there's a problem that you run into, please let us know. We're a full .NET open source company. We love building tools like this. We build them for our own consumption as well. And if there's anything we can do to make it better, please go ahead and let us know. Thank you. Well, that'll do it for this video. If you found this video useful, please don't forget to check the description to find links to other resources we may have included. So blog posts, GitHub code samples, other videos, so on. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. We'll catch you next time. Thank you very much.